I'm in the centre of Bristol, a city and county in southwest England with a population of almost half a million in 2016. Around the beginning of the 11th century, Bristol was known as the Place at the Bridge in Old English. The city received a royal charter in 1155 and was historically divided between Gloucestershire and Somerset until 1373 when it became a county of itself. One of the UK's most popular tourist destinations, Bristol was named by the Sunday Times as the best city in Britain in which to live in 2014 and 2017, and Bristol also won the EU's European Green Capital Award in 2015. My walk around Bristol today begins at the top of Christmas Steps, steep slanted steps constructed in September 1669 and paid for by wealthy wine merchant Jonathan Blackwell. In the 17th century, the Christmas Steps is believed to have been called Lonsford Stairs for a short time, in honour of a Cavalier officer who was killed at the top of the steps during the Siege of Bristol in the English Civil War. The four flights of steps, which are dated 1865 and 1881, are Grade II listed buildings and are now home to a variety of shops. Walking back through the city centre, I came to Bristol Harbour, the original port of Bristol. The city grew up on the banks of the rivers Avon and Froome. Since the 13th century, the rivers have been modified for use as docks, including the diversion of the river Froome in the 1240s into an artificial deep channel known as St Augustine's Reach, which flowed into the river Avon. St Augustine's Reach became the heart of Bristol's docks with its quays and wharfs. The River Avon within the gorge and the River Severn into which it flows has tides which vary about 30 feet between high and low water. This means that the river can easily be navigated at high tide, but at low tide ships would often run aground in the muddy channel. Ships had no choice but to be stranded in the harbour for unloading giving rise to the phrase ship shape and Bristol fashion, to describe how ships and their secured cargo were capable of taking the strain of repeated strandings on the mud. The harbour is now a tourist attraction with museums, galleries, exhibitions, bars and nightclubs. Former workshops and warehouses have now mostly been converted or replaced by cultural venues such as the Arnold Feeney Arts Gallery, Watershed Media and Art Centre, M Shed Museum, Antlers Gallery and the Ats Bristol Science Exhibition Centre, as well as a number of fashionable apartment buildings. The Bristol Harbour Railway, operated by M Shed, runs between the museum and the Create Centre on some weekends and bank holidays. The harbour hosts the Bristol Harbour Festival in July each year, which celebrates Bristol's maritime heritage and the importance of the city's docks and harbour. Most of the activities, including live music, street performances, fireworks and a variety of other live entertainments, are held on or near the waterfront of Bristol Harbour. The city has hosted the festival since 1971 when it was started as part of an attempt to save the docks from being filled in, which was ultimately successful. In 2012, the festival attracted over 300,000 visitors, its highest ever attendance, with the Irene and the Matthew being two of the tall ships to attend that year.
the start of 1984, I had started working for Avon County Council and the headquarters were based here in Bristol. Also by that time, Mum was in a job where she also worked in Bristol. So she decided to move from Portishead into Bristol. And it was her first house. It was Mum's first owned house. So, and she always liked Bristol. So she was really delighted to actually move into the city. And I ended up living here for 16 years overall. Further along the harbour, I came to, probably, its most famous resident, SS Great Britain. Designed by the great Victorian engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and launched in 1843, she was by far the largest vessel afloat. However, her high cost eventually forced her owners out of business in 1846, having spent all their funds refloating the ship after she ran aground at Dundrum Bay. In 1852 she was sold for salvage and was retired three years later to the Falkland Islands. In 1970, following a cash donation by Sir Jack Hayward that paid for the vessel to be towed back to the UK, SS Great Britain was returned to the Bristol Dry Dock where she was built. Now listed as part of the National Historic Fleet, she is an award-winning visitor attraction and museum ship in Bristol Harbour receiving up to 200,000 visitors each year. From the harbour, I walked over to College Green, a popular meeting place for young people. College Green is a regular venue for media launches, press calls, charity fundraisers and product launches. College Green is often the focus of protests against local or national government policy due to its proximity to City Hall. Previously known as the Council House, City Hall is the headquarters for Bristol City Council, for whom I worked from the end of the 1990s. I was never based in City Hall, but worked in various sub-offices in Bristol. Bristol City Council was one of the many councils I worked for when I was living in Bristol. I first worked for Avon County Council and that was for 12 years, but then they were abolished in 1996. Then I actually moved away from Bristol for three years and then came back to work for Bristol City Council for the last four and a half years before I moved up north to Derbyshire. Also on College Green is Bristol Cathedral, the Church of England's Cathedral in Bristol. Founded in 1140 and consecrated in 1148, it was originally St Augustine's Abbey, but after the dissolution of the monasteries, it became in 1542 the seat of the newly created Bishop of Bristol and the Cathedral of the New Diocese of Bristol. This Grade One listed building has tall Gothic windows and pinnacled skyline. The eastern end is a hall church in which the aisles are the same height as the choir and share the Leurne vaults. The late Norman chapter house, situated south of the transept, contains some of the first uses of pointed arches in England. In addition to the cathedral's architectural features, it contains several memorials and an historic organ. Little of the original stained glass remains, with some being replaced in the Victorian era and further losses during the Bristol Blitz. I walked up Park Street, which runs northwards from College Green, up a steep incline, linking the city centre to Clifton. Forming part of the A4018, the building of Park Street started in 1761 and it was Bristol's earliest example of uniformly stepped hillside terracing. Park Street is now mainly retail and leisure premises. Among the more unusual businesses are the Bristol Folk House, an art centre and the Bristol Guild of Applied Art. At 
the top of Park Street is the Wills Memorial Building, a landmark building of the University of Bristol. It is the centrepiece building of the University Precinct and is used by the University of Bristol for degree ceremonies and examinations, which take place in the Great Hall. From Park Street, I walked up to nearby Brandon Hill, one of my favourite spots in Bristol. Well, even in the centre of Bristol, there's a bit of countryside. And better still, there is even a tower. Cabot Tower on Brandon Hill is a Grade 2 listed building. It is 105 feet tall and built from red sandstone with cream bath stone for ornamentation and emphasis. The tower was constructed in memory of John Cabot and paid for by public subscription. The foundation stone was laid in June 1897 with the tower completed in July 1898. The architect was William Venn Gough, and it was built by Love and Wait of Bristol. It consists of a spiral staircase and two viewing platforms, where balconies with wrought iron railings overlook the city, the higher of which is approximately 334 feet above sea level. I climbed to the top of Cabot Tower to enjoy the views across the city of Bristol. I quite often used to come to Brandon Hill and eat my lunch. There were certainly worse places to spend your lunch hour. And when I used to sit on the benches eating my sandwiches, quite often grey squirrels used to run up to me hoping to get a bit of a feed as well. Walking on, I eventually came to Clifton Down, where I was about to visit, without a doubt, the most spectacular part of Bristol. I do remember when I first moved to Bristol, I not long turned 18, so it's very exciting for me to be living in a big city for the first time. And through work at the time, I met some people who introduced me to nightclubbing. I used to do that every week in those days. Anyway, I'm now at the edge of Clifton Downs, just above Avon Gorge. So from here, I'm going to see something which for me is the absolute highlight of coming to Bristol. The world-famous Clifton Suspension Bridge spans the Avon Gorge and the River Avon, linking Clifton to Lee Woods in North Somerset. It is a Grade 1 listed building and forms part of the B3129. Designed in the early 19th century for light horse-drawn traffic, it still meets the demands of 21st century commuter traffic, with up to 12,000 vehicles crossing it every day. The suspension bridge was designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, although he never lived to see his creation finished. Work began in 1831, 
but the project was dogged with political and financial difficulties. And by 1843, with only the towers completed, the project was abandoned. Brunel died in 1859, aged only 53, but the Clifton Suspension Bridge was completed in 1864 as his memorial. The Clifton Suspension Bridge's spectacular setting on the cliffs of the Avon Gorge has made it the defining symbol of Bristol, drawing thousands of visitors each year. It is used on postcards, promotional materials and informational websites, as well as a backdrop to films and TV programmes. It has also been a venue for important cultural events, such as the first modern bungee jump in 1979, the last ever Concorde flight in 2003, and a handover of the Olympic torch relay in 2012. Now that is what I call impressive. Being at Clifton Suspension Bridge is a really nice place to end my day here in Bristol. I've enjoyed walking around the city again, a place where I spent 16 years of my life. I've had a lot of memories brought back to me today, but I think for me, the most important thing about Bristol is that I made what became some of my closest friends here. Well, the people around can affect the way I feel. If I sense an atmosphere, it's not easy to ignore. Company.